I had found out about an injustice, it did not sit well with me to just ignore that. I wrote the speech and my parents actually thought that it was pretty crazy. The kickback from the school was pretty extreme. They asked me to remove a reference to the creator. You know, we put the video up there, we thought that she was cute, and then we just started seeing the hits go up. Eventually went over, I think there's three million now. We were not really involved in the pro-life movement. We had no idea that we were kind of right in the heart of this fierce battle. She started getting death threats. She started getting like horrible comments made about her as a person, as a 12 year old. Are you afraid? Very afraid. So we used to say that the university is the place for critical thinking and reasoning and my experience at university is that it's not. There is a specific ideology that you are expected to hold and if you do not hold that, then you will either be told that you were wrong, you unlearn whatever it was that you were taught before by your community, your parents, your religion, whatever, or you are told that you're not allowed to speak out. Welcome back to the show. When I was in university, I remember being told what is mainline in universities today will be mainstream in Canada 10 years from today. If this is true, and if we care about the future of our nation, then a good look at what is happening on our campuses is in order. Perhaps no one has brought this to light more effectively in our time than a man named Dr. Jordan Peterson, who we had the privilege of interviewing recently. Peterson is a professor from the University of Toronto who burst onto the global scene when he openly challenged the Canadian government's move to legislate gender pronouns. He is now Canada's all-time best-selling author and has continued to challenge the rise of what he identifies as a radical leftist agenda usurping the humanities and social sciences in our post-secondary schools. Peterson has repeatedly questioned whether or not free speech and the free exchange of ideas authentically exists on university campuses campuses in Canada today. Well, his theories seemed to prove out when a student named Lindsay Shepard was called into a meeting at Sir Wilfred Laurier University and chastised for showing one of his videos in her class. She recorded the meeting and shared it with the media in what ended up being a large scale exposure of the clampdown on free speech that is happening. Was this incident isolated? Well, according to a website called campusfreedomindex.ca, which watches this issue, it's not. The Campus Freedom Index looked at 60 universities and student unions, and in those 60 assessments, 35 were given an F grade when it comes to free speech. A few examples of the clampdown, the University of Ottawa condoned forcible a forcible shutdown of a presentation by a speaker who opposed radical feminist views. Men's issue awareness events were blocked at the University of Toronto and a grassroots student pro-life display at the University of Alberta. What is happening to free speech in our educational system? That's a great question. Here with me in studio today is Leah Mills, currently a law student at the University of Ottawa and someone who has experienced what we're talking about today firsthand. Leah herself became a YouTube celebrity when a speech she did at the age of 12 went viral. Her and her mother are in studio with us today to share what they experienced and discuss what is happening in Canada on this issue. I can't wait to introduce you to them, so let's get to it. What if I told you that right now someone was choosing if you were going to live or die? What if I told you that this choice wasn't based on what you could or couldn't do, what you've done in the past, or what you would do in the future? And what if I told you you could do nothing about it? Fellow students and teachers, thousands of children are right now in that very situation. Someone is choosing, without even knowing them, whether they are going to live or die. That someone is their mother, and that choice is abortion. Every day, 115,000 children are dying through abortion. 115,000. That means that 5,000 children would die every hour. All those lives, gone. All that potential, gone. And all that hope and future. On. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Oh, it's not really killing, after all, a fetus isn't a child, right? Why do we think that just because a fetus can't talk or do what we do, it isn't a human being yet? The word fetus comes from the Latin word, meaning young one or young child. Some babies are born after only five months. Is this baby not human? 
We would never say that, yet abortions are performed on five-month-old fetuses all the time. Or do we only call them humans if they're wanted? No, fetuses are definitely humans, knit together in their mother's mother wonderful creator, who knows them all by name. Some people might say that, since abortion is legal now, it doesn't matter. It's not our business. But if an action is unjust, it needs to be illegal, and it has to be our business. And this particular law has a huge impact on our society. In 1997, over one million abortions took place just in the U.S. And just last year, over 42 million abortions happened worldwide. I'd say that's a huge impact. I know some people say that the mother has a right to abort. After all, her life is dramatically impacted by having a baby. But I'm asking you to think about the child's rights that were never given to it. No matter what rights the mother has, it doesn't mean we can deny the rights of the fetus. Talking about the mother's choice, the mother may have had a choice not to have unprotected sex in the first place. We must remember that with our rights and our choices come responsibilities, and we can't take someone else's rights away to avoid our responsibilities. At this point, I imagine the age-old question arises. What if the mother didn't choose to have sex? What if she was raped? But let's look at the facts for the U.S. as an example. Only 1% of all American abortions are hard case categories. This includes rape, incest, and the life of the mother being in danger. 1%. That hardly justifies the disturbing volume of abortions that happen these days. And who's to say abortion's the easy way out? I don't think people understand the effects of abortion on a woman. I don't have time to list all the negative after effects, but here are a few examples of the physical effects. 17% of women who've had abortions face complications in their subsequent pregnancies. Some may not even be able to give birth at all. They are also at a greater risk of developing breast cancer if they have an abortion. But perhaps the worst effects or the emotional ones. Women who've had an abortion tend to have more mood disorders, substantial enough to provoke them to harm themselves. In addition, women who've had an abortion are five times more likely to have problems with drug and alcohol abuse. Abortion leaves a woman feeling lost and uncertain about their future. Almost one-third of all women who've had an abortion are dissatisfied with their decision. It certainly is not the cure-all people think it is. I read a story on the Focus on the Family website. It was about a girl who had an abortion. She writes, I had an abortion at the age of 17, and it was the worst thing I ever did. I would never recommend it to anyone because it comes back to haunt you. When I tried having children, I lost three. Something happened to my cervix during the abortion. Sharon Osborne. Hers is just one of the many heart-wrenching stories that nobody tells these days. And those same ones are the ones that we need to hear about. If you walk away with anything after this speech, walk away with the words of Horton. You know him, the elephant that risked his life to save that little speck. Remember him and his famous quote. Even though you can't see them or hear them at all, a person's a person, no matter how small. Thank you. Leah Mills, the Leah Mills, the YouTube celebrity sensation, amazing. And mom, Kimberly, thank you so much for being with me in studio today to talk about this important topic. This is a huge topic for Canada. Free speech mm -hmm. is a huge, huge issue. But I want to highlight right off the bat your book here, An Inconvenient Life. Now, you asked me to do the forward to this book mm -hmm. <laughs> back in the day. And when I was reading your story, Leah, like I knew about the YouTube video that went viral and I knew that, you know, you were being a strong voice in the next generation for life. I didn't know what you had gone through mm -hmm. you know when in your speech so can you just for the people that are watching you don't know your story just quickly share your story yeah so uh, as a part as part of a grade 7 English a project, I was asked to write a five minute speech about any topic I wanted and I decided I wanted to write about something that mattered. If I was going to work hard, it needed to be something important. So I prayed and I asked God for a topic idea and he suggested the topic of abortion. Now in our family, we didn't talk about abortion. We weren't active in the pro-life mm. movement. And so, so it's not like your mom was feeding this to you. Nope. Or... Nope. I had never heard the word abortion a lot of people before. Thought that, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But I'd never heard the word abortion before. We'd never talked about it at home and all that I knew 
knew about the issue per se was uh, I'd seen a two minute clip about fetal development. So I naively said, sure, you know, and I started doing research. And that's when I found out where Canada stands on the issue of abortion. And for those who don't know, Canada is the only Western nation that has no restrictions on abortion. The only other country that has no restrictions is North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, people will often cite China, but they do have restrictions on sex selection abortion, which we don't have. So, which means you can abort a baby in Canada right up to nine months. Absolutely. Plain English, right? Yeah. And so as a, as a 12 year old finding out all this information, I was shocked. Not only that this was allowed in, in a nation I'd been told was humane and advocated for, you know, human rights, but also that we had never talked about it in school. And so I went to my teacher and I said, I wanted to write about this issue. And she said that she was pro-choice and that the topic was too big, too mature and way too controversial. And that if I, if I chose to do this as the project, I would automatically be eliminated from the school competition that was attached with this project. Mm -hmm. And so right off the bat, I had to decide what was more important to me. And uh, I'd like to say I you know, made that sacrifice really easily, but it took me a while. But at the end of the day, I, I had found out about an injustice and I, it did not sit well with me to just ignore that. Mm. And so I told the, the, my teacher that I wouldn't be participating and I wrote the speech and my parents actually thought that it was pretty crazy. They suggested that I change the topic, but I, I pushed through and uh, in the end, my teacher became hugely supportive, but the kickback from the school was pretty extreme. And, so. and we're gonna come to that in a second, but mm -hmm. Kimberly, so you videoed Leah when she was 12 and you're like, hey, I'm just gonna put this on the internet for my friends, right? And family, and what happened when you put the video online. Yeah, so I didn't even know anything about YouTube and I used my son's account, which he was very ticked off about afterwards. But, you know, we put the video up there. We thought that she was cute. We thought she did a great job. We wanted to share it with our friends. And then we just started seeing the hits go up. And I remember, you know, Steve saying, I didn't realize we had that many friends, you know, like it was in the thousands and then tens of thousands. And then eventually went over, I think there's three million now or something around mm -hmm. there. And we didn't expect that kind of um, reaction in terms of the interest in a, a simple girl standing against a very plain wall telling a five minute speech about abortion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, and then what was, what was some of the reaction that, that came, you know, both through the YouTube video and from school? Yeah, I think that's what really surprised us the most is that, you know, there was, there was a lot of support for her and that was amazing, but there was a lot of really negative stuff. And because we were not really involved in the pro-life movement, we had no idea that we were kind of right in the heart of this fierce battle. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the time, President Obama had just been elected. And so there was the whole pro-abortion thing happening in the United States and people just latched onto this from both sides. And mm -hmm. Leah kind of became the middle of this firestorm. And so she started getting death threats she started getting like horrible comments made about her as a person, as a 12 year old, you know, insults. And we were just, you know, kind of sickened that this was even happening, but mm. shocked. Were you afraid? Very afraid. I used mm. to have like, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking that someone was gonna be at our door and we would warn her, you know, if there's a white van going by, don't get into it. You know, we, mm. we were just so afraid for her safety. So why did you keep the video? Did you ever think about taking the video down or? And we did. Mm. We took it down for a short period of time and we got a phone call from, you know, somebody who was very keen and really, really supportive of us as a family. And they said, you know, let's pray into this. And then we prayed into it. We voted as a family and we said, you know, like, we're going to all be, you know, devast not devastated. We're all going to be impacted by this. We mm -hmm. need to pray as mm -hmm. a family. We need to vote. And we all voted that it needed to go back on. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you knew that you needed to be a voice as a family and as an individual. So, mm -hmm. but you had some more resistance at school even mm -hmm. after that. So what happened yeah, so my, my teacher uh, became supportive, but I had to, if I wanted to go to the next level of the competition, I had to speak in front of two other teachers just to verify that it wouldn't offend anyone. And then the day before, after I passed that in Canada, step, offending people is against the law. Exactly, okay. feelings matter more than facts. Yeah, so, freedom of speech isn't a thing, mm, right? Apparently not. So I, the, I, I passed that stage, but the day before I was going to speak, they asked me to remove a reference to the creator from my speech mm. because it was a public school and they mm. said that, you know, it was inappropriate for me to make that reference. But isn't freedom of religion a thing? No, it should be. Well, and I would say freedom of religion is foundational 
to freedom of speech. But um, that as a 12 year old, you probably didn't know Section 2 of the Charter. No, at the time, no, <laughs> unfortunately. As a law student, I do, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you know, in a moment here, we are going to watch a clip uh, of Lindsay Shepard. You know, in my intro, I talked about what happened with her at Sir Wilfred mm -hmm. Laurier. And uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on what's happening, what happened with her, and also hear about what's happening in your world right now because, mm -hmm. you know, some of these dynamics have continued, right? So yeah. uh, we're going to watch that clip right after this. Through the Fate Teen Show, we're tackling issues influencing our nation's future, like freedom of conscience, racism, poverty, the debt, human trafficking, abortion, democracy, and much more. If you missed a show, you can watch anytime at Fateen.tv or on YouTube. We hope to see you there. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fateen.tv or call 613-552-5572 to donate today. And why that might have been seen as problematic by, uh, by some of the students, maybe even threatening? Um, I, don't, I don't see how someone would rationally think it was threatening. Um, I, I could see how it might challenge their existing ideas, but for me, that's, that's the spirit of the university, is challenging ideas that you already have. And I don't know who this came from. I would be interested to see the original complaint or complaints, because... Like, I don't really have any context, like, as to what exactly their problem was. Sorry, can I, um... The thing is, can you shield people from those ideas? Am I supposed to comfort them and uh, make sure that they are insulated away from this? Like, is that what the point of this is? Because to me, that is so against what a university is about. So against it. I was not taking sides. I was presenting both arguments. Okay. So the thing is about this is, if you're presenting something like this, it, uh, you have to think about the kind of teaching climate that you're creating. So bringing something like that up in class, not critically, and I understand that you're trying to like... It was critical. No. I, I introduced it critically. How so? Like I, in, like I said, I, it was in the spirit of debate. Okay. So I understand the position that you're coming from and your positionality, but the reality is that it has created a, a, a toxic climate for some of the students, it, you know, it's, how many? it's great that... Who? <laughs> like, how many? Okay. One? I have no concept of, of, like, how many people complained, like, what their complaint was. You haven't showed me the, the complaint. Yes, I, I understand that this is upsetting, but there's also confidential, confi confidentiality matters. The number of people is respect. confidential? Yes. Okay. It is one or multiple students who have come forward saying that this is something that they were concerned about and that it made them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You're perfectly welcome to your own opinions, mm -hmm. but when you're bringing it into the context of the classroom, that can become problematic. And that can become something that is that creates an unsafe learning environment for students. But when they leave the university, they're going to be exposed to these ideas. So I don't see how... I'm doing a disservice to the class by exposing them to ideas that are really out there. And I'm sorry I'm crying. I'm stressed out because this to me is so wrong. It's so wrong. Can I mention the yeah. gendered violence, um, gendered and sexual violence policy? Yeah, please. So under that, um, it does, gendered violence doesn't just include sexual violence, but it also includes um, targeting folks based on gender. Um, so that includes transphobia, biphobia, homophobia. All those sorts of things are protected under the policy, and so those are things that Laurie has um, upheld as values, as well as the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, and so those are things that we're responsible for um, uh, not um, impacting our students in that way, and not um, not spreading transphobia in that way. Okay, so the, the, what I have a problem with is I didn't target anybody. Who did I target? Trans folks. How? 
by telling them ideas that are really out there, by telling them that, by telling them, really? It's, it's not just telling them in legitimizing this as a valid perspective, as this is another valid perspective. In a university, all perspectives are valid. That's not necessarily true, Lindsay. Well, this this is something that's being debated in current society, and I don't feel the need yeah. to shield people from what's going on in society. Like, okay. to, to imagine that this is happening in university, it's just it's bad. Okay, it's so... Bad. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Took the word right out of my mouth. Yeah, so let's talk about your experience, because when Lindsay released this uh, to the media, it was like a big exposure. Mm. And there's kind of been a little bit of a Me Too movement, you know, without the hashtag, where other students have been coming forward saying, listen, this isn't just happening in Lindsay's scenario, but other students are being told that they don't have a voice, they don't have an opinion, mm -hmm. they can't speak their, their mind on things. So mm -hmm. what's been hap what happened, or what have you observed? Yeah, so... Um so what I've noticed is that they're like if all throughout that that audio clip, they kept saying, you know, certain views are welcome here. Uh, I believe his 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 specific words were certain views are legitimate and others others aren't is what his implication was that these the perspective of other people is no longer welcome. So we used to say that the university is, you know, a free market of ideas. It's a place for critical thinking and reasoning. And my experience at university is that it's not that there is a specific ideology, a specific perspective that you are expected to hold. And if you do not hold that, then you will either be told that you are wrong and you believe that you are wrong and you learn the language, you you unlearn whatever it was that you were taught before, whether by, by your community, your parents, your religion, whatever, uh, or you are told that you're not allowed to speak out. So you can believe what you want on your own time in your own head, but you are not allowed to share those views on campus. So an example is the university, our student federation, which is actually being terminated in, for many different reasons. Um, the student federation passed a policy saying that they will only support pro-choice students on campus, that pro-life activities will not be endorsed and will not be supported. So any clubs, including the pro-life club that I was part of, are no longer welcome on campus. Um, and this is, again, in, in, in a space that is meant to foster freedom of speech, meant to foster that dialogue. And we just, I, I've seen that certain views are respected and others are oppressed. Mm -hmm. So how does that m make you feel, you know, in the, in the context of a nation that's supposed to enshrine freedom of speech, freedom of religion as, and conscience as a fundamental right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, perhaps part of me wouldn't mind if they were honest about it. If they, if, if the university said we only accept people with this specific ideology, I would almost respect them more for that. But because they masquerade as a, a, a institution that is, um, academic, critical thinking that promotes the this discourse and then they only continuously support one ideology, one perspective, that, that hypocrisy is what bothers me on a fundamental justice basis. And so part of what I did at my university is I, I took a, an introduction to feminism class because I identify as a feminist and the the information that was shared in that class shocked me. The, the accusations that they were bringing uh, specifically about certain religious groups. I, I am a religious individual and I, I was shocked by the claims they were making. So I switched in into a feminism program so that I could learn what they were saying, learn their rhetoric and understand. And I would say that is, um, and I, I'm not trying to put myself up, but if you are able to go into a space and hear other people's ideas and be receptive to them, that says a lot about who you are as an individual and the strength of your own ideologies. And the fact that we are sheltering students and preventing them from being exposed to other opinions, uh, we're, we're setting up a, a society that will be made of people who are sheltered and, and don't have the opportunity to think about whether or not their beliefs are true. Mm. And the reality is, is when ideas are given permission to rub up against each other, then you get the best ideas, mm -hmm. right? Because the best ideas emerge ideally and come mm -hmm. forward. And so, okay, let's bring some hope into this conversation because <laughs> this is like pretty heavy, you know? So what can we do? Like, what can we do to be a voice? Like what, if you had Justin Trudeau was right here or the Minister of Justice or somebody else in a seat of uh, authority and power, uh, what would you ask them? What would you say? One of the things that really encouraged me is that every time that Leah would come home from university, she would have, 
you know, these stories about this crazy thing that happened in this feminist class or, or this, you know, Facebook group. And, it, and it, was, it was frustrating and at the same time almost humorous. But in the midst of it, there was these glimpses of light because individual students would come to her afterwards and would say, thank you for speaking up, you know, and then they would have these beautiful conversations kind of outside of class space. And so I feel like the hope is in the individual conversations and the mm -hmm. engagement that happens even on, on campus, despite mm -hmm. what the authorities want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I would say it's funny, just on, on Wednesday, uh, one of my friends found out about the pro-life work that I do because I, I go by a fake name when I do pro-life work. And so she found out and, and she is pro-choice and she kind of came to me and said, okay, tell me about this. Like I, I, I would not have expected this from you because you took a feminism program. And so it, it just opened up this opportunity for us to have this beautiful conversation where we challenged each other, we, we were respectful. Mm -hmm. And I, it's that freedom, it's that diversity that really brings out character when it's fun, founded on relationship and, and genuinely caring about the other person. Mm. Um, if, if you can foster that type of relationship, if you are true uh, to, your, to yourself and you, you express that in all your relationships, it, that exudes you. If you're an individual of integrity, mm -hmm. um, I would say that's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. That and continue speaking, never be silent. Wow. Uh, a wise teacher I heard once said, speak the truth in love. Mm. Yeah. Sounds kind of like what you just said there. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, what's so encouraging about that is there is a hunger for authentic uh, conversation on these controversial issues, even mm. if it's not being fostered from a top-down perspective, the student body. And wow, that is so, so amazing. And uh, so let's uh, continue to be a voice to our leaders on this important issue. You know, we have elections right around the bend. You know, this is something that we can continue to raise with our leaders. Let's uh, continue to keep this a matter of prayer for a nation. And I want to just personally say thank Thank you to you, Leah, <laughs> for your courage, you know, back there when you were 12 and your continued courage. It's going to be so exciting to see what happens with you in years to come. And also for your family, for standing and for being a voice. Uh, you know, I want to close with this one thought. You know, I think what Dr. Jordan Peterson's testimony has shown us is that there is a hunger for a new conversation mm -hmm. on some of these issues. So let's continue to have them. Thank you for being with me today. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you so much for being with us today to talk about freedom in our schools. You know, we love Canada and that's why we do these shows. Our goal with these programs is to cover important topics impacting our nation and provide practical tools on how to build a better Canada for the future together. We can't do this alone though. As a charitable ministry, we are 100% dependent on the generous donations of individuals like you who care about the future of Canada. We wanna invite you to consider signing up to partner on a monthly basis or giving a special special gift today. Currently, we are believing for 200 people who will give $30 to $50 a month to help us keep at it. When you sign up to partner for $50 a month or more, you will receive a free One Dominion book from Bible League Canada about Canada's rich Christian heritage. Thank you for your consideration. Every gift and every amount makes a real difference. Call 613-552-5572 or visit faithteen.tv to join the team. God bless you and God bless Canada.